Ford, Honda, General Motors, the world's biggest automakers are worth nearly $1 trillion combined and spend nearly $50 billion a year on marketing and advertising just to gain your trust. But what if I told you they're hiding a dirty little secret? The truth is, they're lying to you. They don't care whether you live or die. Countless times they've had to make a decision weighing money against human lives. And countless times they chose the deadlier option. And when they got caught, they lied and fought it vigorously in court, using the full force of their legal powers to be found not guilty of any wrongdoing, of mistakes they knew they made, and they negotiated to avoid paying stiff penalties. As someone who loves cars, it's terrible to admit, but the facts speak for themselves. Here are 10 terribly tragic but absolutely true stories about your favorite automakers choosing death over safety and the scandals that ensued. In 1990, when Ford introduced the all-new Explorer, SUVs accounted for 7% of the U.S. auto market. Nine years later, they nearly had 20% of that market. But in 2000, the Ford Firestone rollover scandal caused a nationwide panic when it highlighted to the world just how vulnerable the high-riding trucks were to rollovers and how the public was never made aware. You see, Ford partnered with Firestone on the tires, which had been Ford's preferred tire supplier for nearly 100 years. But when the National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration asked Ford and Firestone to look into the high rate of blowouts that resulted in rollovers, Ford blamed Firestone and Firestone blamed Ford. But there is something wrong with Ford Explorer. With about 100 deaths worldwide, Firestone initially recalled six and a half million tires to detect, investigate, and recall defective vehicles. Blaming the accident on heat, low tire pressure, and the Explorer's weight and handling. But a few months later, Ford followed suit, recalling an additional 13 million tires. It was a feud played out in public, but through it all, neither company ever took larger steps to ensure public safety. In 2002, Firestone and Ford split their 100-year partnership after executives from both companies dragged each other through the mud in televised congressional hearings. It didn't matter if the tires were defective or if Ford's engineering was poor, the public lost. Despite paying out millions of dollars in lawsuit settlements, neither company has ever accepted responsibility. The National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration received a report in 1969 of faulty Chevrolet engine mounts that could cause potentially fatal chain reactions. But when the issue was brought to General Motors, the company responded that it had already received 172 reports of failed motor mounts. But instead of acting on the public's best interest, both GM and the NHTSA remained silent for nearly three years before publicly acknowledging the problem. You see, the engine mount used in the full-size Chevys from 1965 to 1969 could potentially collapse at high speeds, torquing the engine out of position and putting stress on the throttle body, resulting in unintended acceleration. GM revealed to the NHTSA that it had been using the same engine mounts for its cars since 1958. Given how horsepower and engine displacement increased during the 1960s, these out-of-date components were not designed to handle the additional workload. The media took notice and GM announced that it would recall six and a half million vehicles to fix the problem, citing that publicity was the issue rather than legitimate safety concerns. Ford introduced the Pinto in 1971. The car was a big hit for a while, selling over 300,000 units in its first year. But the Pinto had a fatal flaw, which Ford was well aware of. The fuel filler neck could separate and puncture the fuel tank in a rear-end collision, spraying fuel into the passenger compartment and igniting. In a 1977 Mother Jones expose, it was revealed that Ford knew about the defect even before the car was manufactured, but decided it would be too costly to fix. The cost to safely upgrade the fuel system would have added $11 to the cost of each car, but a shield to keep the tank from bursting only cost $1. 
To make matters worse, an internal Ford memo from 1973 was leaked to the media, outlining how many deaths to expect per year from the defect and how much each lawsuit was expected to cost the company. The memo eventually decided that this was a better option for the company than spending money to fix the problem. By 1978, the public outcry had grown so strong that Ford reluctantly recalled one and a half million Pintos, along with the identical Mercury Bobcat, and made the life-saving fuel system changes. But as a result of the car's fatal flaw, up to 900 people died. Ford ended up paying hundreds of millions of dollars in civil suits, proving its cost-benefit analysis wrong, and having a significant impact on the company's financial stability well into the 1980s. After paying out millions to Pinto victims, Ford faced another disastrous recall in 1980 when the NHTSA announced that the Ford automatic transmissions built between 1966 and 1980 contained a defect that allowed them to slip from park into reverse causing them to roll unexpectedly. According to Mother Jones in the Detroit Free Press, the company was aware of the defect since at least 1972 and rejected a design improvement that would have cost only three cents per car to fix. Instead, the company chose to pay $20 million to victims and their families in private. The NHTSA was on the verge of issuing a 23 million car recall, a move that would have likely bankrupted Ford. Ford executives pleaded poor to the Reagan administration and a compromise was reached. The solution? Stickers. The company would mail out 23 million stickers to four owners, reminding them to ensure the gear selector level is fully engaged in park and to fully engage the parking brake before turning off the car. Audi is a luxury behemoth today, but in the late 1980s, it was reeling from a scandal that nearly drove it out of the American market. The Audi 5000, which was introduced in 1982, was a good-looking sporty sedan that was instrumental in establishing Audi as a premium luxury brand. Unfortunately, on November 23, 1986, the TV show 60 Minutes broadcasted a shocking expose on the 5000, interviewing owners who claimed that the car would suddenly accelerate. To demonstrate its point, 60 Minutes aired footage of an unoccupied 5000 jolting forward on its own. Now in fairness, what viewers didn't see was that the car had been modified by the TV crew and was being pushed into gear by an air compressor. But Audi didn't help matters, coldly insisting that all of the accidents were the result of driver error, blaming it on dumb customers, and running condescending ads with car quizzes that said, if you can pass this test, you're ready for an Audi. However, after a lengthy investigation, Audi was correct. Drivers in the United States, Canada, and Japan all reported that the Audi's narrow gas and brake pedals confused them, sometimes leading them to believe that their brakes had failed when in fact they were actually flooring the car. Audi was vindicated, but the damage had already been done. That 60-minute segment sparked a panic. After selling more than 75,000 cars in the United States in 1985, sales had dropped to only 12,000 in 1991. Audi would need nearly 20 years to regain its pre-1986 American sales figures. And nearly 30 years later, that 60 Minutes report is regarded as one of the most sensationalistic and deceptive news stories in modern journalism history. There have been numerous recalls and scandals affecting millions of vehicles, but none compared to the size of the Takata airbag recall, which involved 10 of the world's largest automakers and at least 17 million cars. Takata, a Japanese automotive supplier, produced airbags that were susceptible to moisture and deployed with excessive force between 2000 and 2008. And if the airbag ruptured the metal housing, it could spray metal shrapnel and chemicals into the interior, possibly causing fatal injuries. According to a New York Times expose, Takata was a aware of the potentially fatal flaw as early as 2004, but failed to report their findings to the NHTSA. Takata was fined a mere $14,000 by the U.S. government for failing to cooperate with the investigation. While all 10 automakers have been working to resolve the issue, it's estimated that up to 30 million cars worldwide could have the dangerous airbags. And this scandal continues today, as many people still have these cars on the road. There's many online resources where you can check to see if your vehicle is affected by this recall. I'm going to leave a link in the description. The Chevy Cobalt was supposed to be a forgotten compact car. Instead, it will go down in history as one of the most recklessly built and dangerous cars ever sold. The Chevy Cobalt will be remembered for a faulty ignition switch that caused the cars to shut down at high speeds, deactivating safety systems like airbags and anti-lock brakes and leading to fatal accidents. 
As usual, GM was fully aware of the faulty part as early as 2004, but determined that it would be far too expensive to repair. When GM finally decided to address the problem in 2006, it went so far as to replace the faulty part with an updated one bearing the same serial number, effectively masking the problem. After nine years and 13 deaths, General Motors decided to recall 2.6 million Cobalts and nearly identical Pontiac G5s. However, the story doesn't end there. Faced with a $10 billion civil suit, GM lawyers argued that because the deadly cars were manufactured by the old General Motors, the one that went bankrupt in 2009, the new restructured General Motors Corporation should not be held liable. Toyota agreed to pay the U.S. government $1.2 billion to avoid prosecution in 2012 after years of denying unintended acceleration in several Toyota and Lexus models despite mounting evidence. This was the largest criminal penalty ever imposed on a car company. Toyota, like any other recall, initially blamed driver error. The company then claimed that the floor mats were impeding the return of the gas pedal, even though documents revealed that the flaw in the gas pedal assembly was to blame. Toyota came under fire for the first time in 2009 when authorities released an audio recording of a 911 call made by a California Highway Patrol officer claiming his Lexus began to accelerate on its own. We're in trouble. We can't. Well, there's no brake. We're approaching intersection. Hold on. He said the car reached speeds of 125 miles an hour before collapsing, killing all four occupants. Toyota ultimately admitted three years later that it had misled the public and recalled 9.3 million vehicles worldwide. I'm going to give you a break from death and destruction in the scandal and focus on greed and corporate corruption, this time as it relates to Daimler. Daimler reached a settlement with the Securities and Exchange Commission in 2010 after a decade of corruption and bribery. The German automaker behind Mercedes-Benz agreed to pay $185 million in response to allegations that it had made at least $56 million in bribe payments across 22 countries. Daimler earned $1.9 billion in revenue and $90 million in the legal profits from these transactions and paid kickbacks to Iraqi ministries in connection with the United Nations Oil for Food program. Did you know that in 1934, the Chrysler Airflow was one of the most aerodynamic and advanced cars ever built? If you didn't, it's because of this story. The Chrysler Airflow had a radically streamlined design that made it stand out from anything else on the road at the time. So much so that big car companies like General Motors were furious, and they did everything they could do to stop it. GM bought ads in the Saturday Evening Post claiming that the radical Chrysler was plagiarized from top-secret GM designs and presented a danger on the road which wasn't true. Now Chrysler was just a small company at the time and responded by releasing an amazing newsreel showing the airflow's advanced suspension, its use of safety glass, and finally driving it off a 110-foot cliff and driving it away without so much as a shattered window. But GM's smear campaign worked. It faced no repercussions for its actions, and the groundbreaking airflow was discontinued in 1937. What's amazing is that Airflow's unibody construction is a method still used today. It was all steel at the time when most cars were made of wood, and it offered almost modern safety advancements at a time when even low-speed accidents could be life-threatening. Now before we go, let's talk about the good news. With the rise of the self-driving car, auto manufacturers claim that the future of death-related crashes will dramatically decrease due to the fact that most accidents are driver error, and once all cars become autonomous and are able to talk to each other on the road, driving will be a safer experience. Also, there really are major advances in safety year after year. Case in point, Tiger Woods' car crash in 2021 should have been certain death, but the airbags in the Genesis GV80 luxury SUV were able to not only save his life, but within one year, he was back playing golf at the Masters again, an astonishing achievement in car safety that should have been given more credit. The first 100 years of automobiles fundamentally changed humankind, and there's no doubt that the next 100 years will only continue to bring greater and greater advancements. But at what cost? Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. And if you can't wait for the next one, take a look at these videos right here that you can watch right now. And with that, I'm signing off. Take care.